So if you're a longtime Moto IQ fan, you probably know about our Project WRX, and we haven't done an update video on it for quite a while. Um, we, you know, we did the brakes, suspension, you guys like that video, but you probably wanted to know what we're doing to the engine, so we're going to talk about that. That car has an engine that was featured in our How to Build a Subaru engine that won't blow up. So this is an identical EJ20 that's a stroker with a long rod, control the piston speed, uh, get some of the torque you get with the EJ257, but some of the revving ability of the EJ20. It's a pretty neat combination and that's what's going into the car. Uh, you can check out that video. It's uh, how to build a Subaru engine that won't blow up. Also, we're going to have an engine assembly video of an engine like this coming up soon. If you like our content and want to see more, be sure and hit the subscribe button. Also, go to MotoIQ.com. Uh, you can read in detail about a lot of the things we talk about here. Almost every single video we do has companion articles that go along with it that have a lot of extra detail in them. Uh, also, check out our Instagram and our Facebook. Uh, we post things daily about what we're doing and what's going on around here. So with that in mind, uh, let's get on to the content. Okay, so you know all about our engine and the internal. So let's talk about some of the things we're going to do on the outside of the engine. Probably the most important thing to make power is the uh, turbo system. Now we're putting on a really cool turbo system. It's not like this, oh my God, huge gigantic power but we're trying to make um, a decent amount of power and have super good response. Uh, one of the things about Subarus is that their exhaust track between the turbo and the uh, cylinder head of the engine is really long. Uh, the turbo is mounted high and in, in the back of the engine compartment, so you have a lot of pipe. Uh, what that does is it, a lot of the heat that the engi engine produces out of the exhaust gets dissipated and a lot of the expansion of the exhaust gas takes place in this long exhaust track. That does two things. Um, a lot of uh, what powers a turbo is heat and expansion. So it's an expansion across the turbine and it's a lot of the heat energy released from the exhaust stream. So when a lot of that's being dissipated in tubing, it tends to make the turbo kind of more laggy than it does on a, let's say an inline floor where you could uh, actually control the length of your exhaust manifold and stuff and reduce the volume. So the turbo is going to need all the help it can get to spool. So that's why uh, we chose the uh, exhaust manifold that we did. Uh, it's made by Full Race um, and it's a uh, tri-wide type manifold but it's also a twin scroll. Now a twin scroll is really good for a turbo motor because basically what it does is it harnesses the pulse energy um, of the engine and it hits the uh, turbine sequentially, like one pulse after the other uh, in the firing order. Uh, this improves your turbine efficiency by about 20 to 30 percent and you, your uh, engine will spool like uh, 500 to 1000 RPM sooner just by this uh, manifold design. Now, uh, what is a twin scroll? Well, what you can see is uh, in the header section, uh, it's like a tri -y, so opposing cylinders in the firing order are paired up. Uh, this way, uh, when they go into this part of the header, uh, they're paired, so the pulses come at even intervals. Um, the other thing is um, the tri -y actually helps your mid-range and low-end torque. Um, I'm not going to get into the whole science of header tuning because we've covered that in other videos. But basically, um, uh, when the exhaust valve is open and one branch and the pulse is coming down, uh, since they're paired in, uh, in opposing points of the firing order, the other branch of the uh, Y here uh, has a closed exhaust valve and this actually acts like an interference branch and gives another resonant pulse. Like the pulse will actually go back here, hit the closed exhaust valve, and come down. So this uh, gives more scavenging pulses over the, um, you know, the, the, the four-stroke cycle, and it gives you uh, a broader power band, generally more low and mid-range. 
So in a real quick nutshell, that's how a tri -Y works. And we're taking advantage of that pulse energy to get more bottom in and mid range. Um, so you have your tri -Y upper part of the manifold and it extends to the lower part. Uh, this is the lower part of the manifold and the up pipe. So as you can see, it's divided here. So uh, your even pulses are kept from mixing. To take advantage of the, um, this effect, you need a uh, turbo with a divided exhaust housing. Now, uh, before we get into that, let's talk about this turbo because that's a really cool part of the equation too. It's a Borgwarner EFR uh, 7163 with a 0.80 A over R exhaust housing. Now this is a biggish housing for a uh, two liter but the twin scroll kind of makes up for that. So the bigger of an A over R you have on your turbine housing, the less back pressure you have and the more peak power you have. The disadvantage is the bigger the A over R, the more lag the turbo tends to have because A over R kind of works like, um, like let's say you're spraying a hose at a pinwheel. If you put your thumb over the end of the hose and spray it really hard, the pinwheel uh, spins up sooner and quicker. So a small A over R, like a point, point 0.60 or even a 4.8 or something, is like putting your thumb over the end of the hose and uh, squirting the pinwheel to spin really quick. Uh, you know, like you get quick spool up, but then it's restrictive and you have a lot of back pressure, so you lose top end power that way. Um, the 8.0 is a pretty big housing for a two liter but it uses advantage of the uh, twin scroll to uh, make up for that. So you have the best of both worlds. You have the uh, quick spool of a small A over R, um, but you got the free, free flow of a bigger one. Now, um, what it does is it keeps the pulses separated uh, right into the turbine housing. And you can see the housing kind of has two sides to it. Kind of looks like a butt on the outside, but never mind. Um, and it has two slots that feed the turbine. So you have two separated slots feeding the turbine pulse inputs. And so it's getting hit, bam, 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 bam. And none of that pulse energy intermixes with the other pulse energy. So you're converting as much of that pulse energy to force to drive the turbine as possible. And that's why you get quicker spool. Um, it's like getting something for nothing, and that's really cool. Uh, the other thing about having a twin scroll is, like let's say you have a bigger camshaft with more overlap. Turbo engines always have problems with too much overlap because they have more back pressure because the uh, turbine takes power to drive it, and it kind of acts like, um, like a restriction. Uh, I mean, it is a restriction because it necks down really small in the housing and you're using all that energy to drive the turbine. So turbo engines have like two to three times more back pressure than a naturally aspirated motor. So because there's so much back pressure, uh, if you have too much overlap, the exhaust flow can actually flow backwards through your engine or stay in your um, combustion chamber where it can cause detonation and for sure it causes intake charge dilution where you can lose power. Um, when you have it uh, separated, the pulses are kept um, totally separate until they hit the turbine. And then that way, if you have a cam with a little bit more overlap, it's really hard to get cross pulse contamination for, uh, to opposing cylinders. Uh, so that's another advantage of a twin scroll. You have less reversion and less contamination possibility on overlap. Another good reason to have this. Um, another reason is, um, the more cylinders you have in the turbo, the less effective a twin scroll is. Like if you had like a, a V8 with a single turbo, a twin scroll almost doesn't even matter because the pulses are co coming so quick, they're almost um, not discrete anyway. So it's not worth the expense and the more complicated exhaust on the V8. Uh, a six cylinder is like borderline to where a twin scroll makes a significant difference, but a four cylinder with its four distinct strong pulses, it makes a really big difference. 
And on the rotary, it's really sick to where it almost spools too quick, but that's a whole nother story. That's how twin scrolls work. That's uh, a really short explanation of how triwise work and uh, why we selected the full race manifold. Uh, some other things, uh, the full race manifold is made out of really thick, I mean, I think this is schedule 40 tubing. I don't know for sure, but you know, this is about an eighth inch thick uh, tubing. And you know, anything before the turbine is this thick stuff. That's good for a couple reasons. Uh, one reason is on the Subaru, the entire weight of the turbo is supported by the exhaust system. And that's a bunch of weight. And uh, you know, when things get hot and um, you know, you don't want things to crack and you don't want the uh, turbo to um, actually start moving around. And when you have a thin tubular um, manifold with no support, you know, it's putting a lot of extra stress on the exhaust. But the full race is really thick, it can handle it. I mean, it has beautiful uh, robotic TIG welds. Um, it's a work of art. It's really thick. It's not going to budge, warp, or anything. Like, look at these flanges, they're so thick. Uh, you're not going to have any exhaust leaks. Um, it's really quality. Um, it'll probably never crack. Uh, another thing is uh, I was talking about um, Subaru's having this long exhaust uh, pipe run before you hit the turbo and losing all the heat and pressure energy. Well, when you have all this thick stainless tubing, stainless has half the thermal conductivity of mild steel, so it keeps the, the heat in the pipes better. And when it's thick stainless, that works even better. So you don't lose nearly as much heat um, as you would with a thin tubular steel uh, header and up pipe. So more of that, that heat is getting to the turbine to drive the turbo. You know, that's, this is what makes this full race system a, a really good choice. Um, I think it's one of the best for like a moderate power uh, Subaru motor. Now, I guess we're gonna talk more about the uh, turbo. Now the Borg Warner um, EFR series of turbos are really innovative and they have a lot of really cool features that um, I guess I'll talk about next. The first thing is it has a ball bearing center section. The ball bearing center section um, has really low drag and it also is less susceptible to thrust wear and things like that. So it's more durable, it has less drag, less drag means less lag and better transient response. Like um, the ball bearings probably make a 20% improvement in response. Uh, it's well worth it and uh, a, a lot better for durability and, and wear. The other cool thing that's really innovative is the turbine wheel. Now, um, most uh, turbos, the turbine wheels are made out of something like uh, Inconel or Mar-M, like heat resisting uh, metals. But uh, on the Borg Warner, it's made out of titanium aluminide, which is a kind of ceramic-ish metal. Uh, the cool thing about that is it weighs about 40% less than your regular, like an Inconel turbine. Um, what this means is a lot less inertia and of course, quicker spool. So you have your ball bearing center section and your low in, uh, inertia rotating mass, and uh, that helps um, improved spool. So you have your tri-Y, low heat conductivity, and low uh, friction, and low mass, all contributing to get uh, cr for less turbo lag. So hopefully this overcomes some of the disadvantages of Subarus being relatively laggy for their displacement. So the EFR turbo has a really unique turbine wheel. It's called a mixed flow turbine. And what the mixed flow turbine does is it takes some of the advantages of a radial flow turbine and some of the advantages of an axial flow turbine and combines them. Now like a radial flow turbine is like a conventional turbo turbine wheel. The uh, exhaust comes in, hits the outside of the blades like a paddle and shoots out the middle. That converts the exhaust energy into mechanical energy to drive the compressor pretty efficiently so you get faster spool and whatnot, but one of the disadvantages is it doesn't flow too good. Now an axial flow is sort of like the turbine on the jet engine. The exhaust gases just shoot straight through it. It has the best flow, least amount of back pressure, but it also doesn't convert um, 
exhaust flow into shaft power as efficiently. Now mixed flow is kind of in the middle. Um, it, it has some of the attributes of a radial flow and some of the attributes of a axial flow. It's the best of both worlds. Uh, you get some of the quicker spool, but you get some of the freer flow. The only disadvantage is maybe it spools a little bit slower than a re regular turbine, but you make that up with the uh, ball bearing center section and the divided exhaust housing. I think this is one of the only um, performance mixed flow turbines on the market, but it's uh, really cool, really good for making power in a small package and really low back pressure. Um, some of the other cool things about the EFR is the uh, turbine housing is stainless steel instead of cast iron. So you don't have this nasty brown rusty uh, turbine housing making your engine compartment look gross. But from a functional standpoint, like we said with the headers, um, the stainless steel has half the thermal conductivity of cast iron. So it keeps a lot of the heat inside to help drive the turbine. And it's also less heat that radiates around in your engine compartment. The center section of the turbo is uh, made out of aluminum. Like most other turbos, this is cast iron. So it gets rusty and nasty looking and it's also heavy. But with the aluminum center section, that saves weight, stays nice and clean. It's a pretty nice feature. This turbo also has a lot of other good features. Um, some of it is a huge internal wastegate. Um, a lot of internal wastegates are a small tiny flapper that gets boost creep, but the Borg Warner one is a huge flapper which is about the size of some external wastegates. So um, you can have the flow of an external wastegate with the uh, cleanness of packaging and the lack of need to have an extra thing on your exhaust manifold that can crack or leak or cause problems later down the road. It's also like angled so the flow uh, comes out with the exhaust flow and it doesn't impinge on the flow um, exhaust from the turbine so it doesn't really cost you power. Like a lot of other turbos the uh, wastegate flow just blasts right into the uh, exit flow of the turbine creates a lot of turbulence and power loss, but this actually merges smoothly and um, You know this whole part of the housing is actually a diffuser Coming out uh, from the turbine discharge So it gradually tapers out to your exhaust pipe diameter for your, your downpipe So this whole thing flows a lot better than your typical internal wastegate turbo um, it's why we did this instead of using an external wastegate because it's just elegant and you don't have stuff cluttering up your engine bay. Another really cool feature is uh, this turbo has its own blow-off valve built into the compressor housing. So you don't need to get a compressor bypass valve or a blow-off valve. It's already right here. All you got to do is hook this up to your manifold and um, when you close the throttle, uh, it, it bypasses and it, you can actually see the outflow uh, is discharging right into the inlet of the compressor. So it just has a nice, short, efficient path. And you don't have to clutter up your engine bay with a, another gadget. It's all right here. Uh, the other cool thing is your boost control solenoid is built right into your compressor housing. So you don't have to have an external boost control solenoid and you don't have to buy an extra part. It's, it's all right here. Um, if you want to uh, use your ECU to uh, monitor your um, compressor wheel and your shaft speed, there's a boss here so you can put a uh, shaft speed sensor. That's another thing you don't have to mess around with. Um, you know, like a lot of street guys, it's a bit much, but if you're racing, and you're tuning your turbo to get every bit out of it and every bit of response. You have to make sure you're not exceeding your design shaft speed. And you, maybe you want to log to see how fast it's spooling up. Well, you can put the sensor in right here without welding and fabricating or messing around. The sensor just drops right in. Another cool thing is the compressor housing is held in with a V-band. It's not like a bolted flange. so. If you want to clock things different to fit inside your engine compartment, you just loosen up this V-band, you know, one bolt, you can spin it around any way you want. Or if you want to service it, it comes apart really easy. Um, that's a real nice feature.
Finally, the uh, compressor has what you call an extended tip. So the inducer of the compressor wheel actually extends out into the housing. And according to Borg Warner, that gives it like um, an extra part to uh, kind of uh, suck the mixture in um, more uh, quickly, I guess. So it's a more biting surface for that initial bit of suction. It's kind of hard to explain, but that's kind of the simple way. And uh, so the, this, uh, this compressor will start making boost pressure at a lower shaft speed, and that equates to uh, less lag. The extended tip maybe gets, gets a little bit less peak efficiency, but most of us would rather have a little bit of um, uh, maybe a point or two of peak efficiency loss to get some some less lag. So there you have it. And that's kind of an innovative Borg Warner feature that's on their turbos. So this is a pretty much a state of the art turbo. Uh, this turbo is good from, it produces uh, anywhere from 220 to like maybe 520 horsepower. And our target power for this motor is good is going to be something around 450. So we're trying to build a 450 wheel horsepower, super responsive engine. And this turbo combination uh, is going to get us there. And uh, it, it's going to be a really cool setup. and can't wait to get it on there. So for the rest of the build, uh, you have to have a good fuel system. And Subarus are notorious for having inadequate fueling. Uh, so we're going to fix that really good. Our plan is to run flex fuel, so everything has to withstand ethanol. That's really important. Um, and uh, with ethanol, you have to deliver quite a bit more fuel volume than gasoline. So some of this stuff is uh, pretty highly flow rated. We're going to start off with a uh, radium fuel hanger. Now, we did a whole video on these uh, radium fuel hangers and Subarus, so we'll have the link to it. But this is a really good unit, um, drops right in, has a little mini surge tank. It has an extra big siphon jet pump to get fuel out of the other side. And we highly recommend it. I mean, goof proof wiring, um, extra terminals for running multiple pumps. We're going to run a single pump in this case, but in case our customer gets the bug for more power, we can always go uh, dual pumps with this because there's provisions for it. So a really nice unit, uh, highly recommended for any serious Subaru build. And uh, go see our other video for lots of details. Some of our stuff, uh, we used more radium things, like we used radium fuel rails. Uh, some of the cool things about the, these are uh, basically the big interior volume. So there's a, a lot of fuel in the rail, and a lot of that's good to reduce resonance and potential uh, fuel surge issues. The rails come with every fitting, every nut and bolt needed to install them on the motor. That's another thing that saves a lot of hassle. Um, I didn't show all the little fittings and nuts and bolts, but they're all quality AN fittings and good quality bolts. So every single thing you need is in, in the box. We're running a high volume radium fuel filter. Since it's E85, E85 tends to scrub every bit of dirt and every bit of particles that was previously in your fuel system, uh, E85 will break it loose and make it uh, get sucked up by the pump. So you want to have a really good high capacity filter. So this is a uh, microglass filter. It's uh, E85 proof and it also filters a little bit better than your typical screens that's in most high performance filters. So you always want to run microglass. Um, so here it is one of the best E85 filters. We're running a radi radium pressure regulator and a fuel pressure gauge. Having the fuel pressure gauge on the regulator actually helps quite a bit when you're doing your initial setup and tuning. Um, I kind of wish we did in some of our other cars because I forgot to set the fuel pressure, duh. And then um, we had a really hard time starting it the first time. So this is a pretty handy thing to have. Subarus are notorious for having really high resistance um, wiring for the fuel pump. Anytime you put a high volume fuel pump, the wiring is totally inadequate. The wires get hot and also puts more of a strain on the fuel pump, so the fuel pump's less reliable. 
So uh, on this car, uh, we're putting Radium's um, uh, fuel pump wiring. It's kind of a universal kit. This isn't exactly plug and play. It's more of a universal thing. Uh, it has this fuse holder for your uh, main power, but it has really high quality wire, um, the right relay, the right fuse. Kind of saves a lot of hassle of sourcing this yourself. Um, having the right gauge and the really good quality wire is important. Uh, a lot of people will wire their car with just stuff from AutoZone, which is pretty inadequate stuff. This is a uh, you know, really good OEM grade wire. So anytime you, you actually wire any high volume fuel pump, I mean, this is kind of the way to go. For the rest of the fuel system, uh, we use uh, Dishworks. We're running their DW400 uh, fuel pump. Uh, th this is 400 plus liters per hour, and it'll flow more than enough for this engine, even an E85. It's a uh, pretty reliable pump. It has a good reputation. It's uh, actually, um, you know, like instead of running two smaller pumps, I kind of believe in running a bigger pump and then having adequate wires. Uh, it's more simple, less to go wrong, and uh, one of the things about running a dual pump, you can have one pump fail, the car will run just fine, but when you go to wide open throttle, it'll lean out and you won't have a whole bunch of warning because it'll run fine most of the time on just one pump. So I'd rather have a single pump. That way if anything goes wrong, uh, you have less of a chance of hurting your engine. That's just my opinion. A lot of people will have other opinions and a lot of people are probably pretty smart about that, but that's what I do anyway. We're also running uh, Dishworks injectors. These are 1700 cc per minute. Um, this is more than enough flow to uh, handle what this engine um, will put out. And even what it might put out in the future if the owner wants to upgrade the turbo and go for more power. Um, so there's like a duty cycle headspace with these. These injectors are all flowed and they come with the, a flow card and a characterization card, which will help your tuner set them up. I think that's a pretty nice feature. Um, a real nice high quality injector. And that about does it for the fuel system. Um, we'll be putting this engine in the car and uh, firing it up. And we'll report to you about what it does on the dyno and what it's like to drive very shortly. So if you thought this video was interesting and you want to see more, uh, like I said in the beginning, um, go ahead and mash that subscribe button. If you want uh, engine building and uh, work on your Subaru, I think we do a pretty good job. Uh, go to MotoIQ.com, go to Garage Services and uh, click the links and fill out a uh, form and we'll get back to you. Uh, so until next time, have fun.